Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening, and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. Last week, CNN ran a story claiming that President Donald Trump could be manipulated by flattery. Stephen Collinson wrote about French President Emmanuel Macron's extravagant show of friendship toward President Trump. He explained some world leaders think the best way to get to Trump is not to rebuke or lecture him, but to flatter him and show him respect. Maybe CNN is wrong again. The flattery idea didn't seem to work for Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. On May 12th, the Jerusalem Post reported Abbas has crossed the Rubicon and voiced unprecedented readiness to reach a peace deal with Israel. Abbas, according to sources, made this clear to President Donald Trump during their meeting at the White House. When the two leaders met, Abbas gushed over President Trump's leadership courage, wisdom. He tried to flatter Trump with the talk of your great negotiating ability. In English, he added, now, Mr. President, with you, we have hope. But so far, at least, the Abbas charm offensive seemed to have had no effect. Abbas is the architect of Palestinians' pay-for-slay system of giving cash rewards to the families of terrorists. In a public statement, as he stood beside Mr. Abbas, the president gave a powerful rebuke. He said, peace can never take root in an environment where violence is tolerated, funded, and even rewarded. According to the Bible, there will be no lasting Middle East peace until Jesus returns. But we should never fault a leader for working toward peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. However, that does not mean we should accept just anything as long as it's called peace. A peace treaty built on lies is worse than worthless. It is dangerous. When the civil war in Syria ends, Hezbollah will aim its missiles south again. And Hamas is always working toward another fight. In other words, pray for the peace of Jerusalem daily because until Jesus returns, Israel will never again be out of danger. Over the last thousand years, one of the hallmarks of Roman Catholicism has been a resistance to change. For instance, St. Peter's Basilica was completed in the year 1615. At the Vatican, they still call it New St. Peter's. But things are changing in Rome and they are about to change even faster. In the British newspaper, The Independent, Samuel Osborne wrote, during his four years in office, Pope Francis has declared evolution is real, assured atheists that they don't have to believe in God to go to heaven, and spoken out against the rise of populism in the West. On the topic of evolution, Francis basically said that God does not have the power attributed to him in Scripture. He said, when we read about creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything. But that is not so. The Pope has one thing right. God is not a magician and he has no magic wand. He has something better, omnipotence and his word, which is the authority of omnipotence. So yes, Pope Francis, God is able to do everything. He doesn't need evolution. Francis went on to say, he, meaning God, created human beings 
and let them develop according to the internal laws that he gave to each one so they would reach their fulfillment. Francis credits evolution with allowing human beings to reach fulfillment. He implies that God could not create humanity in the way the Bible says. So he relied on a greater power, evolution, to do the job for him. The Roman Catholic Church has espoused a belief in evolution since 1950. So that part's not new. The difference now is that this pope denies God's ability to create man without the aid of evolution. He's saying that for God to do as he claims to have done would make God a magician. It's hard to fathom a position more insulting to the God of the Bible. But Francis has made an even bigger change. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. According to Francis, faith is no longer required. He said, You ask me, if the God of the Christian forgive those who don't believe and who don't seek the faith? I start by saying, and this is the fundamental thing, that God's mercy has no limits if you go to him with a sincere and contrite heart. The issue for those who do not believe in God is to obey their conscience. He removes faith, then he makes conscience the final measure of right and wrong. But the conscience is fallible. The Bible says it can be seared, made ineffective, when it is ignored often enough. For him to say God's mercy has no limits is even worse. It is a rejection of Christ and the cross. If God's mercy has no limits, then he would not have wrath against sin, and the cross would not have been necessary. Jesus received God's wrath in our place on the cross. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But that gift is only activated by faith. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Francis tells us that a contrite man need not believe. But Jesus said, He who does not believe will be condemned. 1 John chapter 5 verse 10 says, The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the witness that God has borne concerning his son. Last week, the Associated Press reported, a close confidant of Pope Francis writing Thursday in a Vatican-approved magazine condemned the way some American evangelicals and their Roman Catholic supporters mix religion and politics, saying their worldview promotes division and hatred. The close confidant of the Pope is Father Antonio Spadaro. The Pope's friend bemoans Catholics working with evangelical fundamentalists, calling it an ecumenism of conflict. Over the last few decades, Catholics have worked hard toward a principle of unity or ecumenism among the world's churches. Ecumenical means universal, but under Pope Francis, liberal politics are more important than unity. The article criticizes conservative Catholics who have allowed their faith to influence their politics. So apparently, it's okay for the Catholic faith to push adherence toward extreme left-wing politics, but not toward the right. It's okay, for instance, if they emphasize the evils of capitalism. As for ecumenism, it's okay 
if Catholics seek unity with Muslims, Wiccans, or animists, but not people who believe the Bible and honor Jesus. Evangelicals used to worry that Catholic leaders were trying to bring all of Christendom under the leadership of the Pope. But if you truly believe the Bible, the new Vatican leaders don't even want you, not even if you are already a Catholic. Among liberal Protestants and liberal Catholics, a new breed of clergy is coming into power. They want to create a new all-inclusive super religion. All-inclusive except for real believers in Jesus. Under this new religion, old labels like Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, and Catholic would remain, but over them would be a one-world super religion. According to the Bible, these people are unwittingly setting up the religion of the false prophet, a religion centered on Antichrist and Satan himself. I know I have a large number of Catholics in my audience. Many of you are grieving over the words and actions of this Pope. I grieve with you. This should remind us all that only Jesus never lets us down. In such a time as this, trust him alone. Jesus told us that signs of the end times would be like the labor pains of childbirth. They come and go, then return stronger than before. They also grow more and more frequent. One of these signs is that of famine. Over the last few years, worldwide starvation and hunger seemed to subside. But in March, United Nations humanitarian chief Stephen O'Brien announced more than 20 million people across four countries face starvation and famine. He called it the largest humanitarian crisis since the creation of the UN. The Bible also describes a dramatic rise in drug use near the end of the last days. The New York Times recently ran a major article on the tide of opioid-dependent newborns. Marijuana has always been recognized as a gateway drug, so it's no coincidence that the U.S. opioid epidemic explodes as state after state legalize marijuana. Many conservatives, such as Eric Bowling of Fox News, now support the legalization of marijuana. Bowling emphasizes the tax revenue it generates. But the problem with so-called sin taxes is that sin always costs society more money than the tax revenue it generates. And that's just the money. The real cost is in the destruction of families, wrecked lives, lost potential, and the massive spiritual destruction. They answer that people use marijuana anyway. But historically, legalization always increases participation. By the way, that is one of my objections to the legalization of same-sex marriage. Since legalizing the recreational use of the drug, the state of Washington has seen a surge in marijuana-related traffic deaths. Legalization in Nevada caused such an increase in use that the state had to enact an emergency regulation lowering the standards of who can transport the drug. In Colorado, pot sales have surpassed $100 million per month. The toll on society is yet to be calculated. One letter writer to the Denver Post said, since the legalization, I have noticed constant decline in my community. Many neighborhood stores and other places are closing down and are being replaced by cannabis stores. They are all over the place. Almost every block has one. And the United States is just one part of a global drug epidemic. Jesus also warned of earthquakes 
as a sign of approaching end times. In June, while Yellowstone National Park was recording record numbers of tourists, something ominous was going on beneath the surface. Yellowstone experienced an earthquake swarm, in this case, 878 earthquakes in a month. Most of these were small. It's ominous because Yellowstone sits on one of the world's largest volcano calderas. An enormous chamber of molten rock churns beneath the park's surface. Scientists say the magma chamber is 37 miles long, 18 miles wide, and three to seven miles deep. Heat from the magma powers the park's more than 10,000 geothermal features, such as geysers and hot springs, including the famous Old Faithful. It causes the ground in Yellowstone to periodically rise and fall. Over time, it's as if it's seething. Yellowstone is known as a supervolcano. That means it is thousands of times more powerful than a regular volcano. Yahoo News reported on a study of a possible eruption. Among other things, they found the volcano was capable of burying states like Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and Colorado in three feet of harmful volcanic ash, a mix of splintered rock and glass, and blanket the Midwest. That much ash could kill plants, animals, crush roofs, and short all sorts of electrical equipment. In other prophecy news, the push toward a cashless society continued last week. Visa offered 10000 dollars to small restaurants and food trucks who would agree to stop taking cash. And we continue to see an increase in Satan worship and the occult. These things are so common now that people are becoming accustomed to it. But it's important to understand that they are leading to a time of worldwide satanic worship during the rule of the Antichrist. Over the last few weeks, a battle has been brewing in Belle Plaine, Minnesota. The people in the small town wanted to honor fallen veterans. They erected a two-foot steel memorial and call it Joe. But it featured a cross, and you know what that means. After complaints and legal threats against the cross, the town designated a small area in the park as a free speech zone. In it, they would allow temporary monuments as long as they honored fallen veterans. Satanists took up the challenge and created a veterans memorial that also honored their lord, Satan. Satanists have chosen a symbol and role model of pure evil. They worship someone who stands for murder, torture, rape, pillage, crime, lies, war, brutality, and destruction of all sorts. Many of them say they don't even really believe in the devil, but they still do his bidding. The original memorial meant to honor fallen veterans has been removed. The Satanists got their way again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 15 through 17 describes the rapture. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. If you believe the Bible, you expect that event to happen. 
But believers often disagree about the timing of the rapture. Some say, for instance, that it will occur at the same time as the second coming. I have written extensively on this issue, so I won't go into much detail here. But let me give you a couple of verses to consider. In Luke chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus said, Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. The Lord tells us that he will come for us, the believers, at an hour that we don't expect. But if believers were around to see the emergence of the Antichrist, the invasion of Israel by Russia, and other signs that occurred during the tribulation, how could they possibly not be expecting Jesus to return? The second coming will happen at the height of the most devastating global war in history. Any believers alive at that time would certainly be anticipating the imminent return of Jesus as predicted by the prophets. Yet Jesus also tells believers that he will come for us suddenly and without specific warning signs. We are snatched away before we even know what hit us. We are then taken directly to his Father's house where he has prepared a place for us. In the second coming, Jesus gathers all the survivors to the valley just outside the Temple Mount. There, he separates believers from unbelievers. The believers remain on the earth as mortals and repopulate the millennial earth. The unbelievers are cast off the earth directly into eternal judgment. If the rapture had just occurred, there would be no mortal believers left on earth. There would be no need for a judgment of separation because the rapture would have already done that. And there would be no mortal believers on earth to populate the millennial kingdom of the Messiah. There's only one way to reconcile the two descriptions of Jesus coming. There must be two stages of the second coming. The first is secretly for the church before the tribulation period begins. The second is public and with awesome displays of judgment. At that time, Messiah Jesus will literally save mankind from totally destroying itself and all life on the planet. The first stage, the rapture, can occur at any moment. There are lots of things that must happen before the second coming, but none before the rapture. No one knows the exact time of the rapture, but we know it happens before the second coming. Since we see now a convergence of signs that the second coming is near, we know the rapture must be even nearer. That means your time to accept this free gift of eternal pardon from your sins may be very short. Please don't delay any longer. Accept this free gift of pardon, the one that he purchased for you with his death on the cross today. All you must do is confess to him that you know you're a sinner and can never be good enough to enter heaven on your own. Then believe that Jesus is who he said he is, the Son of God. Now ask him to forgive you for your sins and accept you as his child. Accept his free gift of forgiveness and believe that he will do all that he has promised to do. Ask God to show you how to live for him now and trust him to give you a new heart and a new spirit. He will. If you did that and sincerely meant it, then you have just joined God's forever family. Welcome home. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. God willing, I'll see you next week. 
You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.